Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, warm welcome back. I hope uh, uh, you are finding all the uh, uh, sessions and uh, design and the delivery that we are uh, uh, ensuring here with the excellent support of the Secretariat and our team here. I think uh, uh, to your expectation and uh, to your satisfaction. Uh, we are in the Task Force 3 uh, going to take up a couple of issues which are of uh, key significance as we see the uh, development transitions uh, uh, which are emerging and emerging as uh, not only uh, uh, terms of uh, uh, converging the development priorities, the development challenges that we have, but also how do we mobilize, uh, how do we channelize the uh, development finance which is available and available in terms of uh, uh, having the unique opportunity of directing them uh, to the possibilities that have uh, already emerged as we are trying to cope up with climate change, with the resource constraint, and in an economy which is grappling in some corners with inflation and some corners where recessions are already setting in. So in that situation, how do uh, we position the larger uh, challenges that are there, both in terms of transition for energy, for uh, uh, for better uh, trade and uh, and economic prospects, and how do we do that without adding further uh, to the car accumulated carbon footprints that we have created? So from that point of view, this uh, uh, task force is structured around three broad uh, contestations that are there in our literature. The G20 has been uh, uh, addressing them. T20 has delivered several policy briefs, uh, uh, several different formulations that are there across. And one very unique initiative of uh, Indian T20 presidency that uh, uh, I see uh, as uh, must have been mentioned in the morning, I was not here in the morning, is in terms of reducing the number of task forces. And that's where we have prevailed as a team. And, uh, and fortunately, we could bring down the number of task forces in the T20 presidency of India. The second unique initiative that I see as extremely important, and which is the mandate of this task force, is to bring in this whole question of uh, ethics and value system. The fact that the uh, disconnect between the way our finance sector is working, the way IFIs are drawing resources, spending them, cornering countries, disrupting supply chains, blocking uh, uh, supply of essential medicines and, uh, and uh, uh, even food. Uh, now, uh, 55 countries have knocked the door of uh, IMF and out of that, 25 are exclusively uh, for uh, support on food. So this is something which is going to be a huge challenge. RIS as an as a institution is also linked with the Agriculture Working Group with T20. We are trying to have a dialogue with the uh, Agriculture Working Group to support this idea of uh, food security and uh, a, a, a paper on G20 in terms of how food and nutritional security is to be ensured. So from that point of view, the first point that this task force is trying to address is to bring in ethics and value system in our deliberations. And that is something we are trying to bring in in finance, but that is equally important as we talk about technology. So whether it is artificial intelligence, whether it is uh, genetic engineering, we know the two babies who were produced in 2018 and a, a fantastic book has come out uh, from Manchester University just this fall uh, uh, where it is discussed in terms of ethics and, uh, and uh, uh, global priorities, the challenges we are facing, the title of the book is The God. And if man is starting to play God and producing these uh, two babies who are already there in, in one of the G20 countries, it's, it's a major blow uh, to, to ethics. And the idea is that these uh, uh, babies, their uh, uh, genetic makeup is uh, manipulated not to get AIDS and, and also uh, typhoid, cough and cold. So you can see uh, the challenges that are there with rise in technology. So our uh, issue here is that the task force would address first and topmost priority within the task force mandate is to address ethics and value system. They are important for international relations, they are important for food security, they are also important for IFIs and their working. So that's the first component that we are trying to address. This also brings us to uh, the focus on uh, uh, the changes that are needed 
uh, for our lifestyles. And this is more in terms of persuading individual behavioral change, but also institutional adaptions that are needed so that the lifestyles are adapted uh, to the planet, to the environment, and the kind of uh, challenges that are emanating it from. And that is where a bit of course correction is needed, both in terms of our financial architecture, but also the way social and uh, uh, other associated uh, uh, financing uh, is, is, is possible. So that's the first uh, gamut of issues which are coming in. Life as an overarching framework, but ethics and value system as one that is important. Second uh, uh, component of that comes out uh, in form of uh, how we are seeing this in connection with uh, uh, the nature of uh, infrastructure financing that is coming in. And this is uh, an extremely important connect that we are trying to bring in here as to how we see uh, infrastructure financing, which is uh, uh, important in several different ways, the uh, uh, resilient infrastructure that we are talking about, uh, trying to bring in uh, the issues which are relevant for uh, uh, infrastructure financing, in what way, with what modalities this can be done, what are the priority areas. So as you might have seen, the background note that we have evolved for the SDG Task Force 3, and we would have our extremely accomplished panel now uh, to discuss and take out the modalities, the frameworks, and the financing mechanisms for uh, infrastructure, which is uh, uh, resilient and uh, uh, inclusive in its uh, approach. And that is way uh, catalyzing such uh, processes are important. And third and the last uh, is in terms of uh, uh, focusing on measurement. So if we are making the transition, as I said, uh, in the first component of ethics and value system, bringing in life in the process, what kind of measurement we can do. And that's where our call is that we time has come, that we go beyond the gross domestic product, the GDP, how we go beyond GDP. 1930s, we thought of an indicator, it came up, it was widely adopted. Amritya Sain, Mahbubul Haq made efforts and the Human Development Index came in. Probably time has come in that we factor in what Daskopta Committee, uh, the Treasury of the UK suggested. It's a very nice 600 page report that Daskopta has come up with, emphasizing on the role of biodiversity and the role that uh, we need to factor in from economics perspective. And once we do that, we need to realize the fact that GDP is not the sufficient measure. It may be an important indicator, but we need to go beyond that and, and bring in uh, uh, the uh, issues that are related to biodiversity conservation, the issues of well-being. And the COVID crisis has uh, made us all realize that how important the well-being is. It is not about the accumulated wealth, but it is about its distribution. It is about the well-being of the people and the equitable uh, participation of all citizens of all countries in this. So how we bring that in? So these are the three broad mandates that we have uh, in the SDG Task Force 3. As I said, so far, uh, the T20 has evolved in such a way that only, unfortunately, economists have only contributed, dominated, and nurtured the T20 uh, in several of our areas. I think we need to open to other streams as well. We need to allow more and more submissions from countries that are also equally important, be that from Africa or from uh, uh, other parts of the world who do not have adequate representation, both in the thought process and also the outcomes. So from this uh, perspective, SDG3 is trying to bring in a whole bunch of philosophers, geographers, and also those who have been very actively thinking in terms of the way urban planning is required. And that urban planning requires a connect with biodiversity, so the people from natural sciences. And we have made an effort in SDG3 uh, to, uh, uh, to bring in people from all different specializations for more comprehensive response to the deceleration we are seeing in sustainable development goals. And that deceleration can be adequately addressed if we have strategies which are enriched by experiences, insights, and understanding from other streams. So economics is important, but that's not the only discipline to lead us as we are realizing the contours and the limitations. We need to see that this multi-pronged uh, uh, cross-domain connect is important. As I said, with cross-domain, it is cross-border also. The G20 has its own borders. We need to 
go beyond those borders to bring in others in the process. So the SDG Task Force 3, I think, is a very unique proposition to bring in all several different uh, ideas, uh, 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 approaches, and also the modalities uh, for our collective development. And from that perspective, I see uh, uh, the, uh, the panel today uh, captures the, uh, uh, the uh, 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 sort of plurality of perspectives that I was talking about. Last point that I want to mention here is more in terms of how in the times that, that uh, we are uh, grappling with the absence of any uh, development paradigm, SDG3 also uh, would try to make this uh, unique effort of going towards, uh, uh, a, a, not I would say an alternative development paradigm, but certainly a development paradigm which brings in life, which brings in ethics and value system, and also modalities for financing infrastructure uh, in the way that is uh, uh, resilient, but also supports the ideas that are uh, uh, important in terms of us to uh, take the whole process forward. So I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi. That really does uh, set the context for our third plenary today, which is finding consensus on global well-being, life, energy transitions, and the SDGs. I am going to invite our speakers to the stage. John K. Kirkton is director and founder, G20 Research Group, University of Toronto, Canada. Noura Mansouri is King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, Saudi Arabia. Sehi Jong is Senior Climate Diplomacy Associate, SFOC, South Korea. Victoria Palushnova is Lecturer at HSC University in Russia. Elizabeth Sidropolis is Chief Executive, South African Institute of International Affairs in South Africa. And in the chair is Vibha Dhawan, who is Director General at Terry India, and also the chair for Task Force 4. A very good afternoon, and thank you, Sachin, for making my life easy because you have introduced the topic so well. Well, when, uh, and as rightly and I should say extensively explained by Sachin, the task force on life, green transition, and accelerating SDGs, they share a common goal of promoting sustainability through climate mainstreaming changing consumption patterns, and achieving security in food, water, and biodiversity. And sustainable lifestyles, which I always say, that's something which was engraved in DNA of every Indian. Sustainability was very much there, which is a practical philosophy that aims to reduce personal and societal environmental impact by making positive changes which counteract climate change and other negative environmental concerns. In fact, if we look back the way we used to live, say, three decades before versus today, we can realize some of the environmental footprints ourselves. And it's not very difficult to revert back to what we were practicing earlier. And basically, that is the need of the hour. We have to encourage people to minimize their use of the finite resources of the earth, and thus reduce the damage to human and environmental interactions. We, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution and waste, these are the three main planetary crises which have been created by decades of relentless and unsustainable consumption and production. There is an urgent need for individuals to manage resources in a sustainable manner and come together as a global community to tackle the climate crisis. A person's choices operate within broader contests that enable or constraint action, including physical environment, cultural conventions, social norms, and financial and policy frameworks and are inseparable from income levels and access to resources. The important thing which we must keep in our mind that many a times it's due to action of some of us, the others suffer. And what is happening in Jyotima today is one such example. And one must be very careful that our lifestyle should be such 
that we are able to sustain witnesses for decades to come or for uh, be, uh, remain available to the mankind that resources forever. The global policy agenda now specifically refers sustainable lifestyles as evidenced by the Paris Climate Change Agreements and the recently adopted Sustainable Development Goals. And Goal 12.8 sets the target by 2030, ensure that people wherever they have relevant information and awareness for sustainable development and lifestyles in harmony with nature. In the midst of global climate crisis, it is important to recognize India's leadership and climate actions for addressing the climate change phenomenon. At UN Climate Change COP26 conference in Glasgow last year, Honorable Prime Minister Modi announced Mission Life, and that is to bring individual behaviors at the forefront of the global climate action, as well as to mobilize individuals to become pro-planet people. <clears throat> the concept of managing Resources in a sustainable manner ties into another of the fundamental pillar of life, that is an environmentally conscious lifestyle that focuses on mindful and deliberate utilization. Sustainable resource management primarily addresses the management of resources in a way that their sources are not depleted and the resources available for use by future generations mindful and deliberate utilization. Use as much as needed and reuse as long as possible of resources available is one of the few ways to guarantee that as a planet, we do not reach a point where certain resources are not available anymore. The mission plan to create and nurture a global network of individuals namely pro-planet people, P3, who will have a shared commitment to adopt and promote environmentally friendly lifestyles. Through the P3 community, the mission seeks to create an ecosystem that will reinforce and enable environmentally friendly behavior to be self-sustainable. There is a central role for communication and public engagement to change the way sustainable lifestyles are discussed in public forums and to emphasize the dynamic and complex relationship between systems and behavior. Communicating where actions would be most impactful and the changes to lifestyles are a necessary component to meeting global emission reduction targets is a powerful tool that can be used by a diverse range of actors. Solutions need to target individuals and households, as well as stakeholders group, that is communities, businesses, institutions, and governments that shape the context of consumption and lifestyle. To create an enabling environment within which the sustainable lifestyle can flourish is top-down approach, as well as bottom-up approach, that is by engaging individuals, household, and communities to seek personally meaningful solutions and engage in grassroots experiments and social innovations. This session, I hope, will provide an opportunity for task forces to work together towards common recommendations for a holistic support for transitions. And I'm very glad because we have such an eminent group and already introduced uh, 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 earlier in the session. And of course, I'll look forward to their comments, but basically I'll also look forward to questions, to some, some basic questions. <coughs> and let me pose some of them, and of course as we proceed, we'll uh, uh, also, there will be few additional questions that will emerge. The first one is, how do we work on promoting global well-being encompassing the overall concept of life that the Honorable Prime Minister of India has introduced and which has something to do with each one of us, how do we conduct, us, conduct ourselves? 
So that is first question. The second is, what is needed to promote clean and innovative climate-friendly technologies for energy transition? Few technologies are available, but then they also have been used on limited scale. And definitely there is need to develop more technologies which are suited to diverse needs of the stakeholders. So what is it we can do better? The third is, how do we make sure that as a collective, the world reaches its sustainable development goals? Unfortunately, during COVID time, whatever you can say that we have moved few steps forward, but perhaps we have come back many more steps during the COVID time. So therefore, it's all the more essential for us to relook at our strategy how do we make for the lost time or how do we ensure that we still meet our target of uh, achieving SDGs? And how do we make sure that as a collective, the world reaches its SDGs? There are huge co-benefits co that SDGs have on climate contribution. So the two actually go hand in hand. And our ultimate objective for global uh, consensus is to integrate economic, social, and environmental development to reflect overall well-being of humanity. So these are the basic questions. And of course, as we discuss, uh, there may be some more questions based on uh, the answers that we are, will emerge during the discussion. So I'd like to start with Mr. John Kirton. Uh, your comments, initial reactions on these questions. Thank you. Uh, merci beaucoup. Uh, let me start with the uh, central question uh, we were asked to address. How can life, green transitions, and accelerating the SDGs address the common aspiration of promoting sustainability while focusing on humanity's aspirations for economic growth and development. This question properly puts the ecology first. You can't have a sustainable economy or a sustainable development without a sustainable ecology. And if you don't have a sustainable ecology, it's the poor that die first and most. The 17 Sustainable Development Goals correctly recognized that the one on economic growth and the one on development traditionally defined depended for their realization on fulfilling all of the other 15. And among those 15, at least five focused fully on the natural environment. But as we heard uh, this morning uh, from the host Sherpa, progress towards those SDGs as we uh, pass the halfway point have gone into reverse and progress is steadily getting worse. And it's clear now that the United Nations has failed to fill the gap to get progress back on track. Among the alternative global governance institutions, only the G20 has the power to do the job. It alone has a predominant share of the world's ecological capabilities, of the greenhouse gas emissions, and equally important, of the natural sinks that suck them out. That's the technology we need now it's proven its worth for thousands of years, and much of it is free. In greenhouse gas emissions, G20 countries produce about 80% of the global share, led by China, uh, the United States, India, and Russia. In forests, they have about two-thirds, 66% led by Russia, Brazil, Canada, the United States, and China. In peatlands, 
a much more potent carbon sink. The leaders are Russia and Canada, Indonesia and the US. Now with these resources and thus these responsibilities, G20 summits have increasingly committed to act on climate change, the environment and the economy. Two months ago at Bali, for the first time amongst the many subjects they made commitments on, they put the environment first. So a great basis on which to build. But the trouble is these commitments contained few of the synergies that would uh, simultaneously advance progress on the other uh, SDGs. And members' compliance with these summit commitments was only 68%, two thirds. So at Delhi, G20 leaders should keep their old promises, make bolder, broader commitments and synergistic ones, and craft them in ways that will raise the compliance of the ecological superpowers of the world, Russia, China, the United States, Canada, and Brazil to start. How can they do this? How can they improve both their integration and their implementation? First, by emphasizing the economic costs and the health harms in our post-COVID world of ecological destruction. Second, by emphasizing the broad co-benefits of complying with past G20 commitments and delivering more synergistic ones. For example, the G20's repeated commitment to phase out fossil fuel subsidies has now secured average compliance of 56%. 13 years later, and barely half of it has been met. Had it been 100% compliance, G20 members would have cut greenhouse gas emissions by about 20%, saved trillions of dollars, improved people's health and well-being, and reduced crime and corruption as well. Another one, a recent one, uh, the commitment to collectively plant one trillion trees. If they did it, if they improved it, it would increase carbon sinks, natural cooling, biodiversity, clean water, food, fuel, and mental and physical health. Finally, two easy improvements in the G20 process would help get this done, and it could be done for Delhi right now. First, G20 environment ministers should be invited to the meetings of their colleagues for energy, finance, agriculture, and health. And second, for the first time in G20 summit history, invite to the summit as participants the executive heads of the world's major multilateral organizations, UN Environment, UN Climate, or UN Biodiversity, but above all, the United Nations Development Program, the ultimate custodian of our sustainable development goals. Thank you, merci. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'll come to Nora, and before that, I'll just have a small request to make to all the uh, panelists. Please take five minutes so that we'll have a chance to come back again with some other reactions. Thank you. Thank you, Viba. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate uh, T20 India on the excellent start with uh, several hundreds of abstracts already received. Um, um, it's a pleasure to continue the journey uh, of T20, which uh, started in uh, uh, 2020 under the Saudi G20 presidency and continued under 
the Italian and Indonesian presidencies. It was a pleasure to co-chair Task Force 3 and um, looking forward to a productive year. Uh, so my name is Noura Mansouri. I'm a, a research fellow at CAPSARC, which is an advisory think tank based in Saudi Arabia. And it was the uh, co-chair of T20 Saudi Arabia. So to answer some of your uh, driving questions, Viba, and to build on what my colleague John has said, as John explained, uh, the SDGs are intrinsically, um, uh, incredibly interlinked. And I'd like to highlight the trade-off uh, between uh, uh, energy ambitions and climate uh, uh, targets. Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, SDG 7 on affordable and clean energy, and the world is still not on track to meet that, where 13% of the global population still lack access to modern electricity. We have 3 billion people still using traditional fuel for cooking. On the other hand, we are also not on track to meet the temperature goals of 1.5, uh, and the average global temperature increase has already reached 1.26. And of course, that's impacting um, uh, uh, several uh, climate change related uh, ecosystem uh, challenges. Um, so we have these uh, real challenges here and, and this trade off. Which brings me to uh, the first point um, that in order to reach 1.5, and in order to do so without hurting the economy, uh, global growth, particularly the growth of the global south, we need to keep all the energy options open. Second takes me to what we learned from last year and the year before, is that energy security cannot be taken for granted. With global upheavals, both in health priorities and geopolitical uh, tensions, uh, and with the global disruptions that were impacted, impacting several sectors, including uh, you know, um, uh, food prices, energy prices, uh, contributing to inflation, uh, stagflation uh, as well. Uh, we learned the lesson the hard way, and um, uh, which is that energy transition, if not done correctly, uh, is very costly. And ultimately, climate change loses salience in the eyes and in the face of um, energy security. So it's important to keep all the energy options open, um, uh, which takes me to the third point, that we need to uh, invest and, and, and equally uh, value all the energy uh, forms, uh, including uh, hydrocarbons, uh, renewables, but also critical minerals for renewable energy and electric vehicles. Uh, we ought to shift the discussion from uh, focusing too much on energy sources to managing these energy emissions as enshrined in the Paris Agreement of Article 4. Uh, we need uh, investments across all energy options uh, and uh, technologies and even uh, minerals. The circular carbon economy, which was formulated under the Saudi G20 pre presidency in 2020, and uh, that was uh, endorsed by all the G20 countries, offers that much uh, dy uh, dynamic and resilient, inclusive, and sustainable approach to climate action. Uh, I know you're looking at me, so I'll, I'll wrap up here very quickly. But just to emphasize that the circular carbon economy uh, accounts for national circumstances is a great way to be inclusive, particularly for the global south, which is the focus of uh, this G20 presidency, and offers a, a, a resilient, sustainable, and inclusive approach to climate action. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Thank you so much. And also sticking to the time. Uh, I'll now come to Elizabeth. Uh, I'm not introducing because I thought it has been introduced, but uh, Elizabeth is the CEO of South African Institute of International Affairs. <clears throat> yes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, and all protocol and thank yous observed and recognized. Uh, let me move on quickly. Um, I, I want to pick up on, on, on two or three key points. The first is possibly to reiterate, I think, what uh, Sachin and others have already said, that we really need to rethink, completely reconceptualize the paradigms that have governed society over the last... Uh, let's say over the last half century or so or more, um, whether we're talking about how globalization works, 
whether we're talking about how uh, the financial system more specifically works, whether we're talking about the way in which we value things, the way in which we consume things, and so on. Um, the point that Sachin raised about going beyond GDP, I think is a critical, um, is a critical initiative that seeks to place value on different things because we have always argued that if you can't, if you don't measure it, and if you don't place a particular value on it, then you probably don't uh, give it the value. It's the same like uh, women's work in raising children. <laughs> if you don't uh, place a value on it, the only breadwinner is the, is the husband. <laughs> um, uh, so that, that is fundamental and speaks directly to the issue of, of, of ethics and, and, and values. Um, and here I want to highlight three or four specifically. That of solidarity, cooperation and partnership, and fairness. These are essential in terms of the objective set out uh, for a more equitable, uh, a more sustainable uh, world where everybody uh, is able to share in, in the benefits that have uh, accrued only to some in, in, uh, as heretofore. In the context of the G20, I think it is important to say, even though there are many challenges that it has not been able to, to overcome, that there have been some processes that have actually facilitated recognizing the need for justice and, and, and social equity. And in a small way, the initiatives that have also come through the G20 uh, uh, and with the involvement of particularly G7 members on the Just Energy Transition Partnerships are exactly that. It's recognizing that big developing countries with, that use, in this in case of my country, coal, cannot simply transition uh, on their own. Uh, they can't transition without bearing in mind the significant social costs that will come when you have a coal sector which probably creates, has a dependency of at least half a million people, uh, uh, of people working in the coal sector. And the levels of inequality that a country like South Africa has. And the same point is raised in when we're discussing India, we're discussing Indonesia, and so on and so forth. So we're, we already have a situation where a, a collective within the G20 has actually been able to roll out an initiative that does hold great potential, although I would argue there is still a lot that, uh, that needs to be done. The second point in the context of solidarity, cooperation, partnership, and fairness is that we mustn't forget about the importance of hearing the voices of the least developed countries. Um, there have been a number of initiatives within the G20, credit to it in recognizing from as early as 2010 the need to listen to those voices, the need to bring that, those into the agenda, but I think there is... Uh, I, you know, I think in, in practical terms, I think it's been extremely uh, uh, difficult and, and has not played out fully in, in some of the, uh, the policy initiatives and, and decisions that have come out of, of, of the G20. And I want to make, uh, I've got a number of other points, Chair, to make, but maybe I probably need to wrap up. One of the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the one point I want to raise here is, you know, in the European Union many years ago, they used to talk about policy coherence for development, PCD. It was a much maligned and probably not well implemented idea. But I think we have to revisit the concept, not the European Union one, but policy coherence based on ethics. So when we, um, and, and here I think the G20 can drive such a process that would feed into more formal multilateral processes. Um, if we just look, for example, at the, uh, at the initiative, uh, the policy initiative of the EU on carbon, carbon border tax adjustments, on uh, the impact that that will have on developing economies exports, which in turn affect their ability to structurally transform their economies uh, uh, bearing in mind the importance of, of the green transition where there are no compensatory mechanisms. Or the issue of intellectual property rights that hinder technology transfers or, initi or initiatives by the global north to help improve customs or tax collection on the one hand, but on the other hand, they encourage uh, illicit financial flows by not clamping down on, 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 on the loopholes that enable that and which therefore undermine 
LDCs and other developing countries' ability to actually contribute in some small way uh, to, uh, 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 to the transition. And then maybe let me just end here by saying, you know, in terms of the paradigm and value shift, consume less and change what we consume, distribute more and better, and produce with lower carbon intensity, um, but recognize that for justice to actually be, uh, be realized, uh, not all rules apply to all countries. And I think it's the point that Noura also raised about the need to, to differentiate. We, we talk a lot about that, but to also look at ways that are not going to be actually completely unfeasible in, in economies with high inequality, high so potential, high social instability uh, and political turmoil. And that is a, uh, as a self-interest of the global north as, it is as, as much as it is of the global south because political instability anywhere affects all of us uh, everywhere. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, can I request Victoria uh, to give her? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And let me please uh, concentrate specifically on the approach that can be done during the uh, our meetings during T20. Uh, the agenda is very broad, not only of our session, but uh, different task forces. Our task force number, seven, uh, number six got more than 100 uh, different uh, academic ideas about what should be done during the Indian presidency. And uh, what should be done now, I think uh, that we should uh, concentrate and uh, prioritize the ideas that are gathering together during our sessions and concentrate on specific topics. It doesn't mean that uh, different ones are not uh, that important. They are also important. But uh, if we want to measure the progress, we should concentrate on specific, let's say, four or five topics and measure uh, the efficiency during the presidency. Uh, we can also go down to the uh, idea of uh, CDGs and choosing different uh, indicators to measure their uh, pro progress. For example, let's take um, urban uh, development uh, and measure specific uh, progress that was made during uh, from 2016 uh, till now, including the uh, idea with uh, and situation with pandemics uh, and including the different flows uh, for, with energy and energy security uh, and measure the progress uh, later on till uh, 2030. Uh, so uh, the uh, CDG is different uh, for uh, different uh, stratas of society. So what can be also done is uh, go down to not only measure the uh, progress of different CDGs during uh, this period, but also concentrate on different stratas and on different regions. Uh, and then uh, the T20 uh, uh, T20 ideas proceed to G20 uh, and measure their progress that made during uh, these periods. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. And, uh, last panelist, Ms. Sehi Jiang. Uh, thank you, Viva, for the introduction. And um, I'd like to introduce her. She's the Senior Climate uh, Diplomacy Associate solutions for our climate. And she has worked closely with global partner organizations to monitor the development of domestic climate and energy policies and analyze the overseas climate policy trends. So Thank over you. to you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll be mindful of time, uh, so I'll be brief. Um, it seems that making sure um, that growth goes hand in hand with sustainability um, continues to be a big homework for all of us. Uh, and transitioning into um, clean energy options 
uh, seems to put us on the right, uh, right pathway to sustainable growth. Um, because in the long run, there is no um, doubt that um, we will have to find ways to um, satisfy our energy needs um, with uh, uh, emissions-free or low-emissions energy sources um, to protect ourselves from the uh, worst damages of climate change. And this will require a transformation um, of the energy infrastructure around the world. Um, for this transformation to, to happen, um, uh, as mentioned by Deepa, of course, life, the bottom-up approach is uh, important to nudge individual behavior. But I do believe that strong and proactive um, government policy to foster innovation and um, technology development need to be in place because the development of um, technology um, that are key to driving this um, transition um, often comes with um, very high um, upfront costs, uh, but not necessarily with the certainty of um, returns. So this is why supportive um, government policy and in initiatives to promote um, such innovation and um, create confidence in returns um, in, future, uh, in future returns are very much um, in, uh, in need. Um, and another key element I would like to point out is that um, to achieve grand, uh, green transition, um, global cooperation is um, uh, crucial um, because uh, for it to happen on time and at the right scale, uh, we all uh, need uh, all, all um, hands on deck. So there needs to be close um, coordination between like-minded countries um, and climate initiatives and alliances. Um, and platforms like G20 um, could be a good uh, platform to do that because as G20 countries, we all have um, a role and responsibility to lead and drive the green transition um, away from fossil fuels uh, to reduce dependency on fossil fuels and, um, uh, and making sure that affordable and sustainable energy options um, fill uh, the fossil fuels place. Uh, so to accelerate the transition into clean energy-based um, system, uh, the power market system in the G20 countries uh, need to be revisited and um, tailored and restructured um, where there um, is need. And of course, finance will be needed um, to drive um, this process. Um, according to the IEA, uh, the net zero emissions require an investment of 5 trillion USD um, uh, per year until 2030 and um, 4.5 trillion USD um, until, uh, per year by 2050. So, It'll be the crucial role of the G20 countries to work on their own trans uh, transition within their home country um, by establishing a fair market and grid access for renewables. Um, and also, as Elizabeth has, uh, had mentioned, outside um, our home ground, we also need to make sure that finance is flowing into um, building clean energy system and infrastructure uh, for other developing countries um, that are in need of that for, for their own transition to happen. Yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, and thanks to, uh, for sticking to the time. In fact, we have almost 15 minutes to take questions from the audience. Uh, you can uh, introduce yourself, post the question for which panelist it is, and we'll gather all the questions and then take one by one. Sure. So we'll start from here. If you can pass on the mic, please. Why don't you, that mic is there if you can stand up and, okay. Hello. Okay. Thank you, Your Excellency. It is an honor and privilege for me to participate in this August audience. I am Falguni Sundaram Biswal. I already work as a young professional for India in international organization. And recently, I am working as a member of Mediterranean Youth Task Force under FAO. So my question is, as you know, we have seven years to achieve 2030 agenda. What can G20 or T20 or G7 or T7 commitment help to achieve and how can efforts be measured? And as you know, uh, African Union already have blueprint of 2063 agenda. That's it. Okay, we, we'll answer your question. And that is in terms of uh, the roadmap and how we are going to meet it. Sure. I'll come to you, sir. I'm Manbu from IRIA, Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia. I, I appreciate all these bright ideas that is coming, very bold oh. ideas. 
Can you hear? <laughs> Can you be yes, little uh, louder? It's little. Okay, and, and my, my question is about the lifestyle and, and uh, lifestyle changes that uh, Professor Chachin mentioned. And the, there is a study at, at, the, at the Oxford University and also it is replicated in Japan. This is, there is a five lifestyle changes that can reduce the global emissions by quarter and 24. That, that includes the lifestyle changes is uh, including less travel or no travel for three years, uh, converting into a plant-based food, and then no buying the electronic gadgets for the next six years. And if you, if you accumulate together, and, and uh, there will be a 25%. And this is not a kind of uh, going back to this old stone stage, but finding a new value and a social contract between the communities. So my question here is, if this is, has to be a subscribed, what could be the agenda for G20? Whether need to, to go to the market, create a market for these lifestyle changes, or go for a regulatory prices like by putting a carbon pricing. Don't say both. If it is a priority and what could be the one, creating the market or going for the regulatory. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. This is Arpit Chaturvedi. I head a think tank called Global Policy Insights and a consulting firm called Insights International. Uh, my question is for uh, Nora, but anybody in the panel could also uh, weigh in on this. And which is very similar to the question asked earlier, which is that uh, are we creating a narrative around sustainability, which means degrowth? And uh, does sustainability uh, have to have that narrative? Or can we frame it in a manner where uh, we can uh, give a vision to the world that, uh, you know, uh, we can probably qualitatively change our consumptions. We may, uh, you know, I think the incentives of the world uh, at a very core cultural value systems are uh, not going to be aligned towards, uh, you know, absolutely reducing consumption in the real sense. But can we give an idea that you would have a world where you'd have never seen it better uh, as, as you would have in a, uh, you know, newer state of equilibrium, which is more sustainable without really killing the consumption, but probably qualitatively consuming in a different manner. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Kapil Narula. I'm a former UN employee and used to work with the Niti Aayog as advisor energy. My question is, is the panel and the task force looking at growing income inequality as well as growing carbon emission inequality? I think that is the crux of the problem and we see it across countries as well as within countries. So this issue needs to be addressed specifically. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just take that question then to you. Thank you, I'm Sita Prabhu. Uh, formerly with UNDP and now with Tata Institute of Social Sciences. My question is, we have discussed about individual behaviors and change uh, and so on and institutional. The role of the communities has not been highlighted. And one of the ways in which the norms of behavior can be changed is to nudge communities to adopt more sustainable lifestyles. I think that's something that we need to focus upon because individuals uh, can live in communities. And unless communities take upon themselves to change the norms of behavior, the real change at the bottom of level cannot happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I'm Ashima Goya. So my, my question is that we talk about changing lifestyles totally, you know, to go from zero to one is very difficult. So we need to specify a path. And here some targets help, you know, benchmarks along the way. For example, in India, I recently came across a very heartening figure that from 217 to 21, the material use per unit of GDP has halved. You know, and energy, substituting green energy for fuel, um, some 9% this year. So uh, I think we should adopt some such benchmarks and uh, set goals which could uh, help along the path and make it more feasible rather than sudden jet start. Sure. Thank you. Yes. 
Manish Chand, uh, India Rights Network and Center for Global India Insight. Uh, my question is uh, about life. You know, this whole idea is a very pioneering concept, but it's more a normative concept, you know, more a spirit with spiritual connotations. How a geopolitical, geoeconomic grouping can really advance this whole idea of life and sustainable living, uh, as most of uh, G20 recommendations are anyway non-binding. So in what way it will make a tangible difference? How will you propagate this? Thank you. Sure. So we have taken all the questions. So I'll start from uh, John from this end and whatever answers you would like to give and then we'll sum up. Thank you. Uh, let me start by uh, borrowing uh, one of uh, Nura's questions. Uh, are we creating a narrative about degrowth, cutting consumption? And my basic uh, answer is uh, no, not relative to when we saw the first version, uh, late 60s, early 70s, when the major theme, the major message was limits to growth, the big book, interpreted as limits to uh, economic growth. What we're slowly beginning to do now and Dennis Snower was uh, pointing in that direction, is developing a new narrative of putting planetary and personal health and well-being together. And yes, that does mean we do have to cut consumption in a number of very specific things. First, we have to cut out using peat as a fossil fuel for a fuel, it's vastly more very, uh, valuable just leaving it where it is. Uh, we have to stop cutting old growth forests to use as fuel. They're vastly more valuable as uh, carbon sinks. And I'm sure you can all think of uh, other things we really have to cut out. We just don't need a fast fashion uh, might be another one. Thank you. So, Victoria. Uh, I've, yeah, does it work? Uh, speaking about the energy transition and energy usage, uh, Naura mentioned in her uh, speech about the energy security which is not granted, uh, and we should uh, measure in uh, the idea of uh, measuring the process uh, of CDGs. We should concentrate on the uh, effects uh, that was made during the time, not only the uh, reasons, but also the uh, what was done during the pandemic times and during the energy crisis or energy uh, situation on energy uh, prices market. Thank you, Nora. Yes, thank you, Viba, and thank you for all the questions. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for all the questions. I'll try to reflect uh, right. on uh, some of them, but I'll start with the question that was um, asked to me on uh, growth versus uh, meeting climate targets. And if I may uh, c respectfully disagree with, with you, John, and, and also with Dennis and, and, um, in the previous uh, panel, I think that uh, in order to pursue a just energy transition, developing countries have the right to emit and they have the right to grow. So it's very unfair to talk about limits of growth for developing countries and, and put it in this context. We, we should uphold the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. And uh, I'd like to uh, quote the uh, book launch, um, the quote that was quoted in the book launch, which is that net zero is net positive for everyone. It's net positive for the global south and it's net positive for the global north, but it's important to tackle the issue of common but differentiated responsibility. Developed countries that already have uh, 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 the opportunity to grow their economies should make space uh, in emissions for developing countries. And so the, the decoupling um, uh, narrative uh, is not fair and is not just uh, for the energy transition. The circular carbon economy uh, concept, which I have uh, elaborated on, uh, 
exactly tackles this problem because it, it accounts for national circumstances, resources endowment, and makes space for developing countries and, and have a climate action strategy that is resilient and that can weather uh, global upheavals, whether it's health, shifting health priorities or geopolitical tensions. So it's important to have a climate action strategy that allows for economic development and economic growth, particularly for, for developing country, having an inclusive uh, uh, strategy and um, uh, valuing all the energy technologies and all energy options. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, she. Yeah, John. Um, I, I hear that there are a lot of questions on um, the LIFE initiative as it's a newly co uh, coined concept. I do think that um, there needs to be an open platform and dialogues to discuss um, what really um, life movement is, is uh, what it is and what it entails, um, so that uh, there could be knowledge sharing um, and narrative sharing between um, individual actors. And I also wanted to touch upon um, the point on just transition. I do think that keeping the just and the fair um, uh, element of any transition alive uh, when developing uh, different policies or um, coming off with an international commitment um, would, is very important. Um, and especially for the energy um, transition to be sustainable, this needs to be designed in a socially just and fair way, um, taking into consideration the livelihood of the people whose lives are um, tied to um, the fossil economy. So it brings me back um, to the need and importance of the policy framework um, and incentives needed on the national level, but also on a sub-national level. Um, Perhaps I can introduce a case uh, from Korea. Uh, in my home country, we have a coal province called Chungnam, uh, which hosts almost half of the nation's uh, coal fleet and has a very um, coal-dependent um, economy where its biggest mode of income comes from uh, coal projects. Um, but transition is underway. Uh, and not destroying the livelihood of the people is on their key agenda. Um, in 2021, Chungnam government raised a just transition fund um, uh, worth of 80 billion USD to um, ensure the job security of the coal power, uh, coal power plants uh, workers in the region. Uh, and they're looking into ways to um, best spend the, uh, the money for the good of the community and is requesting uh, the national government to create such a fund on a national level to um, lead the just transition process. So Chungnam, um, this case, uh, the, the, the just transition agenda has been carried over from the old um, leadership to the new government, and this really shows the impact of strong, um, substantive, um, subnational uh, policy framework in consideration of the livelihood, uh, which could be very crucial for um, climate um, integration and uh, implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but... <laughs> Uh, Elizabeth, yeah. I'll, I'll pick up on the question on, on communities and how, can you hear me? And uh, uh, norms of behavior uh, needing to be driven by them. And I think, I think that's, a, that's a very important uh, point. Um, but I would add to that um, the following. So we at the Institute have now for a number of years been working with um, young people in high school as well as in, uh, in university uh, on various programs. It started off as a model UN debate, but it's now really focusing increasingly and primarily on sustainability issues and getting young people to be uh, involved and understand not only the issues, which often they know more about than we do, <laughs> but also how you effectively participate in conversations, in, uh, in policy processes where you make real meaningful input and impact. And they actually also do projects on the ground in their communities. And, and one of the interesting developments out of that is that the socialization and the changing of behavior is being driven by youngsters, uh, not the other way around, but working in their communities. So I, I think it was also an observation that you made, and I, so a, a comment, I, I agree with it, and I say we mustn't forget about that. We must also think about, uh, about the young people in, in, in those communities and those processes. But I think it's also the case that clearly if, we, if we're wanting to, uh, to do 
emissions, if we're talking about fossil fuels, we're obviously also needing to bring in other stakeholders into those conversations about, about changing behaviors. And the issue of value here is, 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 is critical. What, what is value? One last point about the, the, the issue of, uh, you know, shouldn't be degrowth. Absolutely. Um, I, I think um, we need, to, it, I, I, I agree with you absolutely. Um, but I think for economies such as South Africa's and others, it needs to go hand in hand with the fact that if we can take initiatives around renewable energy, uh, where we can increase and diversify the energy mix and therefore also reduce the footprint, I think that's also very important. I think we've made some progress in South Africa in that regard. I think there's much more to do and much, certainly much more quickly because we're actually not producing enough energy right now from coal. But um, I, think it's, I think it's those two together. But it, it has to be a recognition uh, that, at, uh, that developing countries' energy footprint, uh, carbon footprint, is going to grow over the next few years, particularly some of the poorer countries. And that is only, the only way, really, that these countries can, can develop. But it doesn't mean it has to be as intensive. As Absolutely. So thank you very much to all the panelists. It was very intensive discussions. And I'll say it life as it states, it's every stakeholder gets impacted by climate change and every st stakeholder has a role to play. How do you change your lifestyle so that we have a better planet to live in? Thank you very much.